Well, welcome to the Josh Hall Web Design Show. Web Design Show. Helping you build better websites and create a web design business that gives you freedom and a lifestyle you love. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 22. In this one, we're going to be talking about how hosting an event can really boost your business. And for this talk, I brought in somebody who is very, very skilled and passionate about this subject, Tanya Quintieri. She is, uh, well, she has a couple different brands. She has a site at mrsdivvy.com where she is a Divi website designer, but she also does multilingual content and web design translation. So she is very connected into the translation world, which is just kind of a wild, fascinating world in itself. And she has kind of merged these two brands together by building websites with Divi and working with clients when they're translating their websites from, say, English to German or German to French, et cetera. And the cool thing about this is that she has really become an authority in the translation world by hosting events. Now, when we're talking about hosting events, this, of course, could be something local, like in person, whether it's through a chamber of commerce or something like that, or for those of us in the Divi community, there are these lovely things called Divi meetups and word camps where we could potentially host an event and bring people together. But you can also do it online. There's a variety of ways to do that, which we talk about in this episode. And Tanya actually had me on recently for a big two-day online summit. And I was one out of, I think there were 14 or 15 speakers, something like that. And she did it through Facebook. It was live for two days. And it was all for her translation tribe, her translation um, community. And it was just an incredible event. All the speakers were amazing. I caught several talks and it was a, a great way to bring people together. But more importantly, as you'll find out through this episode, it really helped elevate her as an authority in that realm. So if you're looking at the title of this episode and thinking, you know, I'm not sure if this is going to be for me. I'm a web designer or a, and a business owner. I don't really want to host an event. I would encourage you to have an open mind about this because I sure am. I, uh, after talking with Tanya about this, I'm very inspired to potentially do like an online event. I've always thought about hosting an event here locally in Columbus, Ohio, specifically for Divi, to do a Divi meetup where, you know, my brand would sponsor the event. Um, but I'm really, really considering doing some sort of online summit, bringing experts together to talk about a lot of the challenges and pain points we have as web designers. Got a lot of ideas in the works, but in any case, it might be something that you consider too, because particularly if you're just starting out, if you host an event, if you bring business owners together and you're kind of the connector between potential clients or, or if you just provide value by either doing a presentation yourself or bringing in other experts, it can really elevate your brand, boost your company, and really just make you look like an authority. So it's something that's worthwhile considering on a small or larger level, and you'll hear all about it in this episode. Now, before we dive into this, this is brought to you by my website design course, which at the time of actually launching this episode, the uh, website design course just launched today. So if you are interested in learning the design aspect of website design, you want to learn how to get a better eye for design, want to know how to make websites that actually convert, and you actually want to earn more because you're a more valuable designer who can create really beautiful designs, that's what this course is for. So it, uh, if you're listening to this episode on the day it came out, the course just launched and it's available for you to join today, I would love to help you level up and get a nice eye for design to help you build beautiful websites. All right, guys, without further ado, enjoy my talk with Tanya Quintieri about how hosting an event, either locally or online, can really do wonders for your business. Listen to this one all the way through because there's some gold, gold nuggets of information. All right, enjoy. Tanya, welcome to the show. Thanks for taking some time to chat with us today. Thank you for having me, Josh. So this is an interesting talk, and it's a kind of a selfish, a, a selfish interview, mainly in the way that I have thought about hosting an event. Um, but I think this is going to be a really valuable talk for a lot of different people because I know there are a ton of benefits to hosting an event, wh whether it's a local event or whether it's some sort of online summit, which is what you did and what we're going to talk about, um, particularly for those in the Divi community. There are these lovely opportunities for us called Divi Meetups, and there's WordCamps and all these different sorts of meetings that we can have in and around WordPress and the, and the wider WordPress community. 
Um, there's so many benefits that I'm excited to get into. So that's what we're going to talk about here because you hosted an awesome, awesome online summit, which I'm really Thank excited you. to dig into. Before we get into that and before we hear about how that helped your business for some inspiration, I'd love for my audience just to get to know who you are and what you do. Yeah. Um, so my name is Tanya Quintieri. I'm 43 years old, mom to three beautiful children, um, of which two are already out and about doing their jobs. Um, I started freelancing in 2002 as what we would now call a virtual assistant. Um, and then uh, shortly after I started, I got into translation um, just because that paid better than waiting tables. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I had like two jobs at the time and one of them was waiting tables. And um, yeah, so 2009, I quit my day job and I went into freelancing full time. Um, at that point, translation was my main source of income. And um, in 2010, I think it was, I built my first WordPress website for myself mm. with the help of a designer. And I really loved that because before that, I'd, you know, I'd be maintaining company websites on Typo3, um, which I didn't love so much. A lot of but, HTML and yeah, custom code yeah. and stuff. And WordPress just opened a whole new world for me. And um, in 2012, I became a member of Elegant Themes. And um, so the first websites I built for clients have always been with themes by, um, themes by Elegant Themes, um, Foxy and, you know, all the good themes that they had. Right. And so when they launched Divi, the days leading up to that, I was so excited. Like, I couldn't wait to see this new product and, you know, because I was already so happy with the themes that they had. And so when that email came from Nick Roach that they had released Divi 1.0, I think it was like 1 or 2.30 at night where I was at the time, which was Germany. Mm. And I got online and I downloaded it. I'm like, oh my God, this is heaven. <laughs> yeah. Um, so at the time I was running a design agency for corporate communications together with a proper designer. And... Um, so I kind of brought together the translation part, you know, with international copy and stuff like that. And plus I was building the websites. Um, fast forward a couple of years, my, my private situation changed. I, I was pregnant with my third baby and I knew that I was going to leave Germany um, to relocate to the Czech Republic. Mm. And so I needed to rebrand and I figured I do all my websites in Divi, then I'll just be Miss Divi. <laughs> And um, so I'm kind of like going back and forth between these two communities, you know, the community of translators and the community of web designers. And I feel comfortable in both. Um, and one of the, I guess, natural consequences of that is that I build a lot of websites for translators and mm -hmm. for small business owners. And um, yeah, so all of the events that I organize, they kind of revolve around marketing for freelancers, marketing for translators, websites for translators. Um, yeah. It's, it's really interesting, the, switch, so the situation you're in, Tanya, because yeah, you essentially have two brands. And I, I feel a kinship with you because I'm in that same boat too. I have everything I'm doing right here with joshhall.co, but I have the whole business world, this side of things with my business and transit studios. Most of my clients don't even know about joshhall.co. Quite frankly, I don't really? want them to know how much I'm doing. Um, some of them know, but uh, I'm, I feel you. Like I'm in two different worlds as well. Like sometimes I'm in that world and I kind of, I'm uh, not a different person, but I do feel like a different person in a way because it's just a completely different set of shoes. And I know you're experiencing that well with doing your translation business. And like you said, you have missdivvy.com where yeah, it's almost like it's it's similar to where you're getting a lot of clients through that. But as you mentioned in the summit that I was a part of, um, you you were saying, you know, you probably don't know Josh. He's in my web design community, which is something you all probably aren't aware of. So yeah. it's interesting, but I feel like you're doing a good job of, of bridging the gap between the two. And, and yeah, your summit was not for the Divi community or the WordPress community. It was for translators. And right. it sounds like a lot of freelancers and business owners, correct, that were in that? Right. That's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. But I love that you brought me in to talk about web design. And obviously, we got into podcasting and then um, being an entrepreneur as a dad and having a family and working from home. 
So I'm hoping that all was really beneficial for your translation community well. But I just wanted to start off by saying I, I love how you're balancing the two. And I it's really cool that we are in a position as web designers to do that sort of thing. And quite frankly, it's a great way to diversify. Like as long as you're not stressing yourself out by doing too many things... If yeah. you can combine a couple different endeavors and they kind of intermingle, and as long as it's benefiting both, then more power to you. I think that's awesome. And I found that with my business too. A lot of times I'm getting leads through my Divi stuff. And then people are like, hey, you know, I saw one of your tutorial videos. I'm trying to build my site. I'm just yeah. not a designer. I'd like to work with your company. And we've landed some really good clients that way. So similarly, I'm kind of doing some things too to kind of bridge the two. Um, I actually like to start with that. Like, uh, this wasn't intentionally how I wanted to start, but I'm kind of curious, how have you, how did you manage to, to build both brands and stay sane? Like, did you allocate a certain amount of time to miss Divi versus what you were doing with translation or how have you managed to, to, to balance those two? Um, you know, for the longest time, well, for the longest time is too much, but probably from around 2013 to... 2016, I was actually running like six different websites targeting different aspects of my, my work. Mm. Um, you know, for one, there was my client base that was very local through my, um, through my commitment to the JCI, which is this entrepreneur, young entrepreneur network for, um, by the Chamber of Commerce. So um, I had a lot of really good clients in translation um, from my local area, which is probably kind of um, unusual for a translator because, you know, they're digital workers. And um, yeah, it's just an unusual situation. And then there was the fact that I was outsourcing a lot of translations because as I grew in, in, in my business, my clients were growing too. So initially they would come to me for like German to English translations. And then, you know, a couple of years later, they'd expand into the Italian or Spanish market, whatever. And then they'd be like, can you translate into those languages? Mm. And um, obviously I cannot, even though my last name is Italian. Um, so that's when I started outsourcing. So, but I didn't want to scare away my direct clients, right? By saying I'm this agency, which I still don't see myself as. But um, yeah, so, so I was kind of doing this split online personality, and that did drive me crazy <laughs> until after Zara was born in 2016. And I said, I can't be spending all this time catering to different audiences, um, you know, and kind of watering my message down. So that's when I pulled it all together as Miss Divi, and I didn't really care that the name Miss Divi didn't have anything with translation in it. Um, I just thought I'm going to have to do that through my website copy. Mm, okay. Frankly, the, the clients that I had, they didn't really care. They just knew, okay, Tanya is doing my translations. And ever since I launched Miss Divi, um, most people don't know what Divi is, right? Let's not forget that. So they think it's kind of like something that has to do with divine or whatever. Okay. And so that, that works quite well. Hmm, that's interesting. Interesting take on that. Yeah. I mean, a lot of my clients, if they do happen to edit their websites... Uh, they're like, well, yeah, what's this DV or, uh, <laughs> yeah, they're kind of the same boat. You know, they're not going to know what the heck it is unless we intentionally yeah. train them. Uh, but that's an interesting take that, yeah, that you have it in your name and then the website name. So people are like taking a different meaning to it. But yeah, I mean, shoot, maybe that opens up the conversation too towards like, well, it's actually the platform I build the sites through yeah. and it's a community as well. So that's, that's interesting. Now your Miss Divi site, do you take on regular, you know, just small to medium-sized businesses type of clients or do you yeah. still do mainly just translation based no uh, no um as of workload i would say it's about 50 50 but i do have to admit because i've been translating for so long and i've i've gained a certain reputation um and mainly work with the direct clients um i I hate saying that I'm really good at it because, you know, I'm, I'm not any better than any other translator out there, but um, I'm a very big fan of building good client communication, uh, client relationships. And um, so I get a lot of word of mouth through mm. my, my translation clients. And um, 
I'm making probably 70% of my turnover with translations. Okay. Of well, active that's... work. If I leave away the recurring part, you know, with the website maintenance packages, stuff like that. But nice. of the active work that I do, 70% of it is probably from translation. And that's such a, a niche type of industry. I don't know of any other web designer personally that I've met in the Divi community or word, wider WordPress community that does any sort of translation services. So it's interesting too, like even if it's a smaller type of niche or industry, you can still do some damage. So, you know, you can still clean up in those areas as long as you make some good connections in it. To your point, it kind of expands within that same network. And then you yeah. become that go-to person, which is pretty cool. Yeah. I so did that's really do one connection just recently. I think it was at the end of last year. Um, I signed up to be a WPML contractor. So that kind of to the people who know nothing about translation, who know nothing about um, web design, you know, when, when they just know, okay, I need a website in several languages because that's essentially what I what I put myself out there as. I'm a multilingual content creator and web designer. And then I point them to my contractor page on WPML, and then for some reason it clicks because mm. that kind of does, it, it creates that bridge between translation and um, web design. And it's much more than just installing a plugin, right? That just, oh, yes. you can oh, click yeah. from English to French or English to German or something. I mean, you're really getting into, because that doesn't translate correct no. uh, right i'm sure i'm sure uh, it, that it does, does not it does, it, it does in probably now. some th some terms but i imagine yeah. like even just practical things of like menu design and how things are spaced there's you know some words are smaller in english than they are in different languages and dialects and there's different i can imagine how that is just a complicated wild world translation it is it is especially <laughs> in web design and i think it's always funny when um when web designers say, yeah, sure, I can give you a multilingual site, or when translators say, I can translate a website. And then you ask them, okay, what is metadata? Um, how do you translate strings? You know, things like that. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, it takes a bit more than, you know, just translating the copy that meets the eye. Yeah. Yeah, that is that's really fascinating. I've never thought about this type of thing until encountering you and what you do. I mean, I kind of, you know, we've 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 been friends online for a while now, and I knew you did some translation stuff, but I don't think I realized the extent of it. And just like anything in life, when you don't really think about a certain subject, you don't realize how complicated it is. But just talking to you now, I can only imagine all of the little intricacies of translating of an entire website and then having the design and the layout all part of that as well. So that's interesting. Now, and it gets, it gets really funny when you start working with kanjis or, or um, um, left to right languages. That's when it gets really tricky with design. Oh, I can't even imagine. So you've so interesting. So you've got your two different brands, essentially, that you've uh, essentially merged together in a lot of different ways that they kind of um, help each other, it sounds like. You hosted a couple of weeks ago at the time of recording this, you hosted an online summit for mm -hmm. your translation tribe, I guess we'll say. And I'm curious about how you got them all together. Uh, maybe I'll ask that next here. But you hosted this summit. It was a two-day online summit that people could watch through Facebook. I shared it with my audience on my Facebook and people were able to t tune in live if they wanted to see it. Um, and you had a whole website that you built to go along with it, which, hey, that's a beauty about being a web designer as well as you were able to build that site. And I think you did the graphics and everything, right? Yeah. So yeah. you didn't have to hire any of that out. You did that and were able to, to kind of have full control of the branding because it looked very professional. It was very cool. Um, all Thank the you. talks seem to be so well. How many, how many interviews did you do? Was it like eight or nine interviews? It was 11. 11. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So 11 interviews over two days and you had them spaced out. I was a part of it and it was awesome. I, I got to catch a couple talks uh, and they were really cool and it got me inspired. So I guess my first question, because I do want to hear about how you organize all those people with that, but where did that idea come from? Have you hosted events before that have, have got you inspired to do that? Or what, what made you want to do this online summit? Um, two things. First of all, I did, uh, I, I've done many local or in real life events um, before, like from, you know, a full blown conference over two days to bar camps that went on for two days. Um, business speed dating events, if you want to call it that way. Mm. Um, 
Is that like one of the I, networking things where you sit with somebody and you have like a minute to tell them about your service and then you move on? Yeah. See, the thing is when I see stuff like that, I'll, I'll be like, okay, I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like the other part of it. So then I'll think about how would I do it? And then okay. I'm thinking, okay, this is feasible. I could do this. Um, so what that one basically looked like was I booked a dinner room at a five-star hotel with 40 seats. And I talked to the chef and I said, I want to have a six course menu that takes us around the world. So we had, you know, each course was like, this was European, this was American, this was from the Antarctic, mm. um, this is from Asia. What did you have from America? And, was it a burger or something? Um, I think it was pulled pork. I'm not sure anymore. Oh. But something along those lines. It was something meaty. Nice. And um, so I invited 10 clients of mine. Um, really high profile clients. Um, there was a radio show host. There was a professor from a university um, who was in charge of a lot of spinoffs and stuff like that. And so there was different kind of people. There was a, a the world best sommelier was there, um, who was then at the time the best sommelier of the world. Mm. And um, 30 translators, well, actually 28, because me and my co-host, um, we had to eat as well. So, and the translators had to pay for their tickets. The clients were invited. Okay. And, but what they had to do to get that free meal was between each of the courses, they had to switch between tables. So you had 10 tables with four people each and one of them being a direct client. And the reason why I did that was because so often when, when you're in online for wherever that is, you know, Facebook, on LinkedIn, whatever, um, there's so much speculation about what clients really want, but nobody ever has the balls to actually ask them, mm. you know, because they either come straight out of university or they're so introvert or, um, yeah, just shy, whatever. So I thought, okay, I want to get some people to sit down with a direct client and talk to them about their needs as, as, as the client. Right. And yeah, so that's what we did because I wouldn't have liked the idea of speed networking. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's like, uh, kind of like speed dating. It just sounds yeah. uh, shallow to say, surfacey and shallow, I guess. Now, so hosting that event, and I know you mentioned that you did some other events too. Did that like because I feel like this summit, you were on the ball with everything. Um, you did not look like a first timer. So, did you feel like you were pretty uh, with your experience of hosting other events? Did that help you? Did that transition well to doing an online event? <clears throat> yeah, well. I've also been hosting a video cast channel with a fellow translator for the past two and a half years. And um, in the beginning, we went on quite regularly every two weeks. Um, it hasn't been as often lately, but so I did have camera experience. That plus, again, wanting to do everything differently, I saw a different online summit for translators um, where I thought that looks all very canned. You know, like you buy some kind of bundle, some online course, how to host your summit, you know, and they were ticking all the boxes. It was all looking nice, but it was just so, it felt prefabricated. Fab, fab, mm, okay. um, so I think I started thinking about the summit in September. And I asked my partner, Andrew Morris, who is the founder of the Translation Mastermind, which I used as a backdrop for the summit. Okay. Um, he was like, yeah, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, whatever. Wow, so it's just, I mean, you, you did it in February. So it was just a few months from right. the idea to, to launch it. Now let's see. So you launched the Facebook group for this summit where all of the talks were being broadcasted live and everything. And I think you had like over a thousand people in the group, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it wasn't like it was 30 people. There was a lot no. of people involved with this. <laughs> Um, so yeah, how did that build? Like, was that all your existing network or did you get people to talk to their network and bring them in because it was a free option? Like, how did that work? Well, the thing with the translation mastermind is that there is an official group and it's a closed group where you have to pay to become a member. It's a lot of curated content, uh, a lot of mindset work, things like that. So, um, but I didn't want to do the summit just for them because those usually aren't the people who need it the most. Mm. Um, as ever so often with free, uh, well, not with free, but with online CPD, those who need it the most can probably afford it the least, right? 
So I wanted to have something accessible, but I wanted to have the strong brand behind it. So I created the second group, which we actually launched on January 1st or 2nd. Um, that's when we opened it to the public. But I also didn't want it to be like, you know, one of those groups where people go crazy because they get notification after notification. So um, they weren't allowed to post themselves, only I was allowed to post. And then I had a dedicated thread where they could introduce themselves, etc. And I did every now and then ask them to um, invite their friends. I didn't ask for email signups, which, which is probably the number one reason why people would want to do a online summit. But I figured if we deliver a great summit, people would come back anyway to sign up, you know, to get the newsletter yeah. or to be on our list, whatever. Um, and fortunately, that's exactly how it was. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, you provided good value for free and got people in the door and then they had that option without you, you know, hitting them over the head with it to sign up or forcing them to right. sign up. They were able to do that as the, you know, if they're wanting to, which that's going to be huge just for, for open rate and bounce rates and everything else, because they opted in and they obviously wanted to be in touch with you. So the next time you email them, they're going to be much more apt to engage rather than that person who just had to sign up and is just dying to unsubscribe. So that's yeah. an interesting tactic. That's really, really cool. So you got, you didn't do any Facebook ads either. Oh, okay, so it was all just word of mouth and all um, word of mouth. I yeah. did I did share the summit uh, website in a couple of key groups, um, you know, that are open to wider audiences. Um, but I was really surprised how how quickly the group filled up. And I think, like, while the summit was going on, people were pouring in like crazy because, you know, the people that were watching it, they were tweeting about it and yeah. writing on LinkedIn about it like crazy. Everybody was like, oh, my gosh, you got to come and watch this. Because I do think that because it was free, because it was accessibly really easy, right? No sign up, um, no yeah. weird questions to join the group, anything. You just click the link and watch. Right. And they were probably thinking, well, the quality of that can't be all that good if it's free, right? Well, we proved them differently. And yeah, I, I think it's better. It's a better approach, a more appreciative approach. Yeah. And it felt organic too. Like it yeah. just felt very real and transparent. Even the couple talks that I caught a glimpse of, um, nothing felt stuffy. Uh, nothing felt like entrepreneurs trying to just sell their services. Uh, even you guys as the hosts, it was just very real and organic and it was super, super cool. Um, I'm curious about like when, when you, you, so you got all the audience and everything, but what about the actual speakers? Like you reached out to me cause you knew me from the Divi community, but what about those other speakers? Were they in the translation industry or were they wider, like different? I mean, you had a, a variety of different speakers, which I thought was really cool. We did have a call for papers, um, but the concept of it to the target audience seemed so foreign that I think we only had four or five responses to that. Mm. So um, Andrew and I sat down probably sometime in December. No, it was actually late November because um, that was when the call for, for papers expired. And um, we looked at what we had and we kind of thought about what we wanted to achieve. And um, so we brainstormed on our own networks and I said um, that I'd really like to bring in some people who are not from the industry just so they, you know, like you, could deliver a totally different point of view, which would give people these aha moments because that's what have, has always made my, my events, whether in real person or online, is what made my stuff different, what made people coming back for more and leaving great re reviews is this is not peers talking to peers. This is experts talking to peers, right? So um, there were a couple of translators that we really wanted to have on because they're just really great at what they're doing. Um, like Virginia, she she's, aside from being a super well-paid translator, she's huge into mentoring and has a great mentoring program. Um, Maria is, she was awarded best content creator on LinkedIn or something like that. Mm. Or, or second, third best, something like that. So um, there were a couple of spearheads, I'd want to call them, who we thought, okay, it would be nice to have these on, on the summit. And thankfully, they said yes. And like I said in the wrap-up, it's 
to me, it's amazing that people like you, you know, who really have a reputation, who have their own personal brand out there, that they said yes immediately, even though this was something totally new. You know, for, for all that you would have known, we could have burned your name. Right? <laughs> By organizing some, pardon my French, but shitty uh, wannabe summit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, th- I mean, that's a good point. And I didn't really know you too well, but I, I feel like I knew enough to where uh, I knew it was going to be legit. And I mean, you had things set up, like you had the website up and everything was, and that's the importance of branding and design too, is it looked professional, looked mm-hmm. like it was legitimate. So that was like, yeah, I, that looks like a really cool thing. And I didn't expect it to translate immediately to course sales or something. I just thought it would be a good way to to give back and talk about my experience, which Anyone who wants to talk to me about podcasting and course stuff, I'm in. So, <laughs> you know, I, I'm down to talk about that. <coughs> did you me, sorry, see any more that. likes on your site or something like that? I did get quite a bit of traffic, yeah, just from people. Okay. And I know one thing I really enjoyed was the thread too, uh, the thread on my talk. A lot of people were like, I really like this talk. Josh you know, was really transparent. And s- some people were like, what's a site? And uh, even though they weren't, you know, web designers, they were still interested in what I had going on, which is really cool. And I, you're hitting on an interesting point too, because the approach that you took with that summit, it's what I take with this podcast too, because I'm not just talking about web design specific stuff that most web design podcasts get into. I mean, we'll talk about some technical stuff as we go along here with actual pertinent like website things, whether it's speeding up your website or maintenance plans and stuff like that. But translating it. Translating. Yep. Yep. That could be a good one. Um, but what I've really enjoyed is having this type of conversation where we're talking about something that is, and I'm hoping as web designers are listening to this, they're realizing that everything that we're talking about here can translate to them hosting some sort of event. Everything we're talking about from building the audience, from merging two different brands or a different experience, um, linking in with the community, um, professional branding, and then setting something up that really elevates your presence in your community and makes you look like an expert. Uh, again, there's multiple ways to do that, which we'll get in here to get into here. But I love what you're talking about because, again, it's the same thing I do with my podcast. I've had talks where I'm bringing in people that are not in the web design community at all. I brought in my financial advisor. Who knew that a talk about saving for retirement was going to be so popular? It's one of my most popular talks. I brought wow. in another colleague a couple episodes ago about getting better at public speaking and getting better at presenting. That's a really big episode too that I got really good engagement on. And yeah, I think it's just because it's different. Like if you listen to most web design podcasts, they're just talking about web design specific things. But all of these other uh, topics that are in and around web design are so, so important. And I think you probably found that too with the summit, right? Like you brought me in to talk a little bit about websites, but also my entrepreneur experience as a dad. And that stuff probably wasn't going to be talked about in any other translation summit, right? Yeah, it was amazing. For some reason, I I can't remember what triggered it. I think it was a chat I was having with Claudia. Um, So so Claudia is another translator. She has a daughter about the same age as mine. And we were talking about, you know, bringing together motherhood and and working. And I said, you know what, let's do this at the summit. Because if it's interesting to us, maybe others would like it too. And so then I just went ahead as a, it was not a theme that I put on the summit directly, but I did mention every, every now and then that this, our first summit was dedicated to the freelancing parents out there. Um, so I did an entire session with her just on motherhood and freelancing. And I thought we were going to get a couple of views. Um, turned out we almost had a thousand views. Wow. And people were like in tears. It's, it's amazing, you know, when you show that you're, I, I would say within the translator community, I'm quite, I wouldn't, not famous, but people know me. Um, you know, I've been nominated, or not nominated, awarded mentor of the year in 2017. Um, I headed an association, I speak at conferences, etc. So people know me. And then you go out there and you show that you're human, that you're vulnerable. And um, that's what really draws them to you. And that's when you get their attention and when you can actually share good stuff with them. And since I know I'm not almighty, I aspire to bring in speakers who could talk about important topics. Yes, you need to talk about how to, you know, use term bases in your software and God knows what, but there's so much more to entrepreneurship. Um, 
that I just think it's important that those topics are touched upon as well. So you were already viewed as a professional or an expert in, in a lot of ways, it sounds like, in your tribe. But I imagine that the summit really elevated, would you say it elevated your presence in the community as, you know, being more transparent and in organizing this? Have you seen what, I don't know if it's translated monetarily yet, but have you just seen that it's really elevated you to even more of an expert type status? If you ask the others, probably yes. Um, the feedback I've been getting has been amazing. Um, just the gratitude out there for, for me recognizing and making it happen that there's affordable CPD for showing that it is possible to do it like that because frankly, freelance translators don't make all that much money. Like, I wouldn't say it's the norm that in Europe, a translator makes six figures a year you know, by working healthy hours. <clears throat> and you don't need six figures to have a comfortable life either, but it's not one of those things, you know, like an IT consultant or something who could easily do a quarter million dollars a year. Um, so it's important because I don't know how many conferences you've attended, multi-day conferences, but, you know, by buying the ticket and, and having accommodation and getting there and actually not being able to work for two, three days, depending how long you're traveling, that can easily sum up to a lot of money. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I think that it's important that they have a choice. You know, I can go somewhere to a great city and enjoy the networking part of it. Or if I don't have those means, then I'll just have to take the CPD part that's available in such summits um, and work with those to get to that point where I can go to the real live events. Well, that's kind of my next question was, what was the inspiration to do an online summit versus doing something in person? So what a great segue. Like just, I mean, you hit it. It's very, very time consuming to do a conference. Now, before I say any of the negatives, it is well worth it. I think everyone who goes to a WordCamp or some sort of conference or seminar, it always feels like it's a lot of work and you're always on the fence. And then by the time you're leaving, you're fired up. It's just anything in person is always awesome. Uh, but it is. It's it's, a, it's an investment. It's an investment of time. It's an investment of often you know the expenses to do that. And then what you just said, you're often taking a couple days off, and sometimes during the week, where unless you have a team to help out with some of that, um, that can be a little tricky as well. Like you kind of have to catch up from those days. Whereas an online summit or an online event. People can tune in. They can actually like I was working while I was watching the talk before me. So. Uh, was that one reason you wanted to do something online or was it more of just logistically there were people from different countries? What, what was some of the jettison of, uh, of doing it online? Well, I figured I, I wasn't expecting the numbers that we had, like really not. I, you know, I was like, okay, if we get 250 people to watch, it'll be nice. Um, but the idea was to get that CPD to as many people as possible. Um, not just for financial reasons, not just for the logistics of it, but because I think we need more of that. Um, we need more because freelancers are sometimes so stuck in their everyday thing, you know, especially when they're introverts and they're not into going to such events. I mean, that's the sure. other thing, you know, so many newbies, the first conference I, I um, organized back in 2015, I think it was, um, I asked online uh, people to tell me why they were not considering going to the conference. And so many of the young people said, I just don't feel like I'd have anything to contribute. I'm like, mm, yeah, but you're there to consume. But then they were like, yeah, but then the coffee breaks and everything, I wouldn't want to be standing there like a wildflower not having anything to say because I have no experience. And um, th there is going to be people like that, you know, both in web design and in any freelance profession, really, yeah. who are but just... Particularly web design, like, where it's easy to hide behind a screen. And uh, right. I mean, a lot of people are probably attracted to web design because they don't have to talk to people. So, uh, But I, th I feel like most web design freelancers find out pretty early on that you need to have that community. And I think that's what's so powerful about the Divi community being online, but you're taking it to a whole other level, actually connecting people with some sort of summit. Yeah, that was fun. I, it's really, really touching to see how 
people are now, um, you know, in that main group that I was talking about, um, where the speakers who are translators um, joined as well. And it's just so nice to see how they're building new relationships. Um, we had this one talk about how to use LinkedIn um, content wise to, right, to, right. to raise your profile. And I'm watching that, you know, seeing people do that because obviously a lot of people. Also, oh, you're have seeing added some of the res- so you're seeing some of the results and yeah. the effect from what you put together. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah. So and I, I said expert, but maybe that's not the best term. It, maybe it's more of a like you're really becoming a connector, like a a people mm-hmm. professional connector, and that holds so much weight and it's so valuable. I mean, for for years. I don't do it as much now, but I'm still in my networking group that actually meets weekly. And leading up to the past couple of years, I was very intentional about anytime I met a professional, I would link them in with somebody I think that could that they could help or it could help them. And I was really big on being that like human connector. And it really did wonders for my business. It may not have paid off immediately, but over time, I mean, a lot of times some of my best clients come from somebody that I met a year ago. And they're like, hey, you know, you connect me with this guy or this gal, and then they mentioned you, and then, you know, blah, 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 blah. Here's somebody else, and they end up being a really good referral. And there's so much power in connecting people, particularly in professional networks like this. Um, So, yeah, maybe you're not viewed as an expert per se, but you're just viewed as um, an authority. Maybe maybe that's a better word, an authority in that uh, that space, which I think is just so powerful. And then what I'm hoping web designers can get from this is – you can host an event, whether it's something local at a Divi meetup. Because personally, I, I've thought about doing an event hosted by joshhall.co here locally in Columbus, Ohio. However, and I still might do that, but um, you've got me interested in doing like a summit and bringing in several different people in and around WordPress and maybe even not technically web designers who might have some other really valuable advice and doing something similar. Um, and knowing that, yeah, it will translate potentially with, with course sales and stuff that actually pay the bills. But more than that, it just elevates my role as the, an authority in the community, which I think is so, so valuable. So that's kind of my, you know, that's my, when I said this is a selfish episode, I wanted to hear about all this because it's what I'm like, I'm thinking about it now. So uh, it's kind of like a this is kind of like a strategy session that we're having with my audience as well because I think it's really beneficial. Uh, even even hosting just something smaller, if you are in an area, I'm talking to Divi web designers here, but if you you can host a Divi meetup, I tell people all the time if there's no Divi meetups around you, host one and just wait to see how people come out of the woodwork. I mean. Um, Nathan, the content manager for Elegant Themes, he lives here in Columbus, Ohio. So we did one where I spoke at in uh, September and we had almost 20 people there and it was great. It was uh, it was a nice small group, but it was awesome. But a lot of the groups may have five or 10 and that's really powerful as well. And then you can really start getting in the community and that's when referrals start happening. That's when good relationships start building and it just translates to business in so many ways. Um, you know, the thing is, when you start doing these things regularly, well, not regularly, but I found that after doing it for like two years, you know, th- doing different formats online, offline, with clients, without clients, um, different price ranges, etc. I was kind of, you know, trying to, to find my thing. And bottom line is, I just love hosting people, no matter where. Um, at some point, it starts coming natural. I remember in 2015, I went to speak at a conference in Zagreb, um, in Croatia. And I hadn't been in that part of, of Croatia yet. So I decided that we were going to stay a week. And so I rented a house for 12 people. And um, I asked among the people who were going to participate if anybody wants to come and stay at our Airbnb for that week. And um, so we had a rainy day one day where we couldn't, there was no conference going on. It was raining. We had originally planned to take a day trip. So I was like, okay, let's stay home and we'll do a Facebook marketing session. (laughs) So we got out of a couple of bottles of wine and we talked about Facebook marketing. Nice. Um, So yeah, it's like at every scale, I, I always somehow end up making an event of it. You know, if it's, no matter if it's a Zoom call or, a webinar or I'll just jump on live, whatever. Um, at some point, it does come natural. Yeah. And I know even um, Gino, who I had on a handful of episodes ago, 
I think it was back in six, 2016, he hosted, like he, um, his company, Meyer Premier, hosted an Airbnb for a bunch of Divi designers and at a WordCamp in California. And that was an example of how it wasn't an event per se, but he, he was kind of the, the mediator between all of them. Mm-hmm. And it really kind of, it kind of elevated the Divi community because everyone got really close. And it was before I was ever in the community, but I still like they'll, a lot of those people will share the memories of that. I'm like, man, that looks awesome. Um, and it really elevated him as an authority in the, in the community as well. So that's something too, like just little things like that can. I, I was at my first word camp last year, um, in Berlin at the word camp Europe. And I learned about it early, early, I think in March. And I said, okay, I'm going to go there and I want to meet some Divi people, right? People working with Divi. So I set up an event sort of like a friend event to the WordCamp on the developer day because I figured, you know, people using Divi aren't necessarily developers. And um, so I put the event out there and a couple of people were like, yeah, we're interested. And then they weren't interested. And I'm like, okay, then I'm just not going to do it. So I was about to cancel it. And then Andrew Palmer approached me and he said, so is this Divi thing happening? And I'm like, no, nobody seems interested. And you know, I was trying to get elegant themes among other Nathan to kind of help me make it a Divi meetup. But for some reason that didn't materialize. So then Andrew said, you know what, let's do that dinner anyway, and I'll sponsor it. And um, we'll just invite some key people. I'm like, okay. So I booked a restaurant in Berlin, pretty hip restaurant, um, really, really good food. And I think it was 14 of us. And that's how I got to meet some pretty big names in, in to me, big names. Um, you know, Site Ground oh, was yeah. there. Um, the Vito from WP Feedback was there. He was just launching his product. Mm. Um, so it, it was amazing who I got to meet there, you know, and, and that has translated to writing gigs, um, you know, copywriting gigs. Um, it, it's, it's amazing. So there's power and obviously going to events, but there's a lot of power in hosting or even yeah. co-organizing or just being yeah. a part of an event like that. And yeah, there's there's also just something about meeting people eye to eye, you know, seeing people eye to eye and actually meeting them person to mm-hmm. person that just translates much more than just meeting somebody online or just being a Facebook friend. There's just nothing there's nothing better than a person to person, you know, live setting. Plus, at the WordCamp itself, I got a selfie with Matt Mullenweg. Oh, nice. Yeah, I hear yeah. he's pretty generous with that kind of stuff. Yeah, but I was gonna, excited like crazy. <laughs> I'm going to try to get him on the podcast once it gets a little bigger. That way I can uh, show oh, wow. him some good numbers. Yeah, I'd, l- I'd love to, to pick his brain about some stuff. So yeah. that's on my little, uh, that's on my little uh, wish list here at some point for the podcast. So You know, the, the thing is with these events, I'm sorry for interrupting you. Oh, you're and fine. I, I think that's where you and I are very similar. We're not doing this for the return on investment, but if there's going to be a return, we want it to be a good one, right? So um, I'm not doing these events, obviously, to make money off the events themselves. That's not the point. My, my goal is to get people connected, to help people learn, improve, grow. Um, but then what happens is they talk about you and they talk well of you, you know, be that on Twitter, on LinkedIn, whatever, some even blog about you. And I think that just to sum that point up, that is actually the biggest return on investment, not just that you're the authority, but you're actually getting some really good backlinks. Yeah. And just practically, I I think that all builds the very important word trust. Like yeah. you, you become that person who people trust that, you know, they can turn to you for a good referral or a good, um, person to help them. And it's interesting that you mentioned that. Cause I think you and I are alike, we're extroverts and we enjoy people and we, and I'm sure you enjoy doing this kind of thing more than writing code or working on a site. Like that's, <laughs> for me, I'd much rather be on this side of things. Um, and what I realized though, I actually just thought about this recently with what I'm doing with the podcast and what I will eventually do with hosting some sort of summit or an event, I've been doing that all my career for free. Like I do that. I have been connecting people. Like I think I've probably spent more time in the Divi community connecting people 
than I have building courses and doing my content. And it's all mm-hmm. been free, which I mean, it's probably technically costly, but I know it's paid off just in in the, uh, yeah, like the idea of authority and trust. Um, but I've been doing that for like, if people need a referral or if they say, Hey, you know, I have this issue with the site. Is there somebody you can recommend to me? That's when I plug them in with somebody else. And I do all that for free. Um, I've been doing that for a long time, but I realized not only have I done it in my career here, but I, with joshhall.co, but I did it before, as I mentioned within transit with my networking group and local organizations and stuff, I've always been connecting. And then as I think about it, I really did that in high school and in my band days too. I was like, our band came together because I connected somebody with somebody else who referred somebody else. And it's so interesting that all my experiences growing up through the band days translated to business and now to what I'm doing with with joshhall.co. So yeah, it's it's just kind of interesting that if you uh, if you think about if you think about experiences that you wouldn't think are, are are parallel or correlate to what you're doing, actually you can pull a lot of value. You can pull a lot of value from past experiences that are completely different than what yeah. you're doing in business. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, Gotta well, agree. awesome. So, so yeah, the idea of a summit I think is is definitely something I'm challenging myself with, and I'm really interested in doing. So I'll definitely keep you posted, and maybe I'll. I'll pick your brain about some of the technical aspects. I mean, you 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 use Skype and you did it live, and now it was only available for a couple of days, right? It was right. it was kind of like a you had, which maybe that helped with the numbers. It was like you had to join, you had forty eight hours to watch the talks you missed, and then it was gone. Now, do you replay those for paid members of any sort of membership? Yes, I do. Um, so we have an academy on Teachable that we just launched. Um, end of summer last year, I think there's two or three courses there. And there's a couple of them that are going to be launched. Um, a few of them are free. Some are, I think, like 20 bucks and others are 90 bucks, depending on, on what, they, what they offer. And we put the summit on there because um, I respect that, you know, if you're an authority in your domain, your time is valuable. So it was never a question for us that we would ask the speakers to do it for free. So um, from that side, how we did it was that we said, okay, we're going to offer you a small token of our appreciation, um, which we're paying out of our pocket. And then they're going to get shares off the sales on, on our academy. Um, so that was the reason why we had it for free for 48 hours until after the summit ended um or from after the summit ended and then it all went to uh, with minor edits you know like cutting off the front and the back Mm -hmm. um adjusting audio and stuff like that um they're on teachable now where people can get them for i think 67 euros so that would be about 75 bucks Gotcha. That's like almost 11 hours of really, really good content. So. Right. I love that strategy. And I think that's, uh, I've been very vocal about potentially doing some sort of mastermind or membership myself. That's kind of the next, I've got a couple more courses I'm working on uh, my design course right now, and then I'm going to do an SEO course. And then I'll have like a nice suite of nine courses that cover pretty much everything that a, a designer would need from the technical or business side of things. And, and then I'm going to transition to really connecting my community in a much higher level way. Um, and, but this idea has has me thinking about doing a summit and making it free to everybody and then doing the same thing, like keeping it available for maybe just 48 hours or 72 hours. And then to get the access to those talks, then you know that's where it's the, get the gated membership or, or something like that. Right. And it's probably valuable too, because if you just let somebody listen to a talk whenever they want at any point in the future, if it's live forever, they're probably going to forget about it. And I imagine oh, yeah. it just you lose the steam of the event. That's one thing that was cool about what I liked you, what you did too. It was two days. It was like there was a lot of anticipation leading up to it. There was a lot of uh, really good energy and fire behind it when it was going on. And then for the stragglers who either you know just missed one or couldn't make a talk because it was in a different time zone or whatever, they could listen back to those. And I mean, recognize too, I think that was a Monday and Tuesday, right? Right. So people were working as well. So they're kind of watching those while they're working. Um, so I love that idea of, of making it available, but only for a limited time, which uh, is a really cool way to go about it. That's something I would suggest anybody who does some sort of online summit or conference or 
or training. Do you know what's ha- do you want to know what's happening with all that stuff now? Sure, absolutely. Because obviously, you know, there was so much work that went into this. You already said it. You know, building the website, figuring out the program, coordinating the speakers. Um, we did have that secret group for speakers where we on Facebook, um, where I uploaded files, etc. Um, so what's happening now basically is, you know, I thought I'm going to leave the people alone for like a week or two. Um, and what's going to happen is that I'm going to be writing blog posts about each of the talks that we had, kind of summarizing it and maybe putting a two to five minute video in that. Mm. So that summary is going to go to our YouTube channel. The blog post is going to go on the website. Okay. Um, of course, always with the sign up, always with a link to the academy itself. Um, within the academy, uh, I, I uploaded each video as a as a lesson and enabled the comments for people. So I'm going to be emailing the students and saying, "Okay, this month we're going to focus on the talk by Josh Hall." And so we're basically going to work through that content together without it really being a lot of work for me. Yeah. But that way, I can repurpose parts of the of the summit, you know, to feed different channels. And obviously this is going to bleed into Twitter and, and Facebook and the Facebook page and Instagram. And so this is basically giving me content for a year, all the while I'm preparing for the next summit. What a great example of how to multi-purpose content to where, yeah, you're taking these talks that you put, you know, you worked your ass off to get going with the summit and i know i can't imagine i bet the i'm sure wednesday after it was all done hopefully you just got to sleep for about 20 hours or something but i know you got a a little one uh but i know all that work that went into that so how cool is it that you can repurpose that and stretch it out over a long time and it gives people a different way to kind of digest that content too and I imagine now you could probably give your insight too i don't know if you talk about some things that impacted you or um, cause I'm sort of thinking about that with my podcast episodes is repurposing them somehow, whether it's breaking off small little clips or little quotes and then posting them on social media or doing, um, I'm definitely going to do some recaps at mm-hmm. some point because there's just been so many gold lessons in every episode. I've not had one yeah. episode that's like, Oh man, that's a dud. Everyone's been awesome. Um, and I really, yeah, I, it's easy to, to listen to an hour episode and then just forget about some stuff if you don't really apply yeah. it. So to kind of bring those back and really hit on, um, some of the, the top lessons learned or top takeaways, that's kind of something I'm really thinking about. So you got me inspired to do that as well. Uh, awesome. so wow. All kinds of good stuff. Looking forward to that. (laughs) Yeah, all kinds of good stuff, Tanya. Well, you've definitely got me inspired to do a little summit. It's making me think I might do it as like a precursor to the membership I launch eventually here this year. So I'll definitely keep you posted and maybe we can have a strategy session on some of the tech stuff and and what you learned. But I mean, you covered so much great detail here with how it's boosted you as an authority. I'm hoping, again, this is a bit of a, a side topic for web design, but I'm hoping all of the web designers who are listening to this realize that hosting an event has so much power and can really just elevate you as authority. It'll bring leads, it'll bring referrals, it'll build trust. And it can also help you like a lot to deepen your niche you know, like get vertical, super vertical to make you mm. then an expert on, on, you know, what it is you want to claim um, or the dom- domain you want to claim. Um, I think there's like two or three companies out there who specialize on making websites for translators. And even though I don't specifically say I make websites for translators on my website, um, it's still translators that come to me and choose me over anybody else because they know I'm one of them. And gotcha. that's the same way it would work, for instance, probably for Melissa Love, the Divi designer. Yeah, like for, for photography. For photography or, mm-hmm. Right. And that can work for anything, like literally, you know, bakers, um, constructions, constructors, whatever, architects. Right. I know I have a local colleague. This was years ago. We went to his little workshop seminar and it was just like uh, an hour talk and it was all about social media marketing, but he invited a bunch of small business owners. So there was like a construction guy, there was a speaker, there was an author, there was 
couple different like blue collar businesses. Like there was all these different businesses and his media company was that, that, br- that connector between everyone. And I'm sure it paid off for him financially with people signing up with his services, but he gave a really valuable talk and brought in some guest speakers and they like dished out a lot of really good information that people could walk away with. So um, yeah, event doesn't have to be in your even industry. It could be a, a little more broad towards businesses in your area, or like you said, more of a niche or niche, as some say. Um, you know, kind of like like you did with translation. Like it was very in that tribe. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to go about it, which is really really cool. So yeah, I just love it. I'm really inspired by what you did. Pumped up about it. Got me got me really thinking about doing something myself. So Great. Uh, I'm sure I'll let you and everyone else know once I have something in the works for that. Um, would you have any sort of parting thought for anyone who's maybe considering hosting a Divi meetup or doing something locally or hosting some sort of online? I mean, it doesn't have to be something huge like you did. It could be a talk with two other or three other professionals, and it could be just be like a little training that dishes out some other information. Would you have any, uh, words of inspiration or a final thought to somebody considering that? Um, yeah, actually two things. Number one, what I feel a lot of people who would like to do stuff like this, um, what holds them back is that they think what they know is not of interest to others, but that's really not true. Sometimes you're just so close in front of the forest that you can't see the single trees. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, so everybody knows something that somebody else doesn't know. And, you know, even if the audience isn't what you think it would be, the right people are going to find you if you put your stuff out there with heart and with good intention. Um, I'm, we're all business people and we all have to make money. But sometimes you just got to do things where you don't know if it's going to be hard cash that's going to be coming back to you or just um, good vibes, good energy, whatever you want to call it. I don't know. Yeah. Um, which will translate monetarily too. That's for sure. That's ex- that's exactly right. So you, um, you feel better. Yeah, yeah. Put it out there with good intention. Um, just like in social media, you know, put yourself out there and give before you take. We didn't even talk about this, but I imagine you learned a lot too, right? With all those talks. Oh, yeah. I mean, my gosh, what a just what a great learning experience to host something yeah. like that. Definitely. Yeah, and the good well, thing is I, I have them on my computer. You know, I can watch them in the evening. Yeah, <laughs> okay. can, yeah, right, right. I do that sometimes with podcasts, just because um, with a podcast, what I'm finding out is when you're interviewing, I try to be fully focused in the conversation, but inevitably I have to keep the conversation going, and there's got to be kind of a start and end point. So a lot of times I'll miss little things, or it doesn't really register with me until I listen to the talk later, or I'm yeah. editing, and I'm like, "Ooh, that was a good quote." stuff like that. So that's one reason I want to do some recaps too, is I'm already kind of excited to go back and listen to a bunch of the earlier episodes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, awesome stuff, Tanya. Well, thanks so much for your time. Really happy that things worked out well for the summit for you. Excited about Thank moving you. forward, how it's going to help you. Uh, definitely everyone go check out missdivy.com. I'll link that in the show notes and then we'll see you around all across uh, social media and my Divi Facebook totally. group. And then I know you're active <laughs> on my, my personal uh, profile at joshhall.co Facebook. So um, yeah. always welcome your encouragement and engagement there. And then, yeah, I guess, uh, and thank you again fun. for being on the summit. <laughs> yeah, no, I really appreciate you having me on. It was fun. Um, I enjoy being, I don't want to say the black sheep, but I enjoy being, you know, something that's a little bit the different. Odd one? Yeah. The odd <laughs> one out. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a nice way to put it, I guess. <laughs> uh, but no, I appreciate you having me. I hope it added some value to, uh, to those oh, you know, the folks, particularly for definitely. the, I don't know how, I don't know what the, male to female ratio was, but particularly for, for guys who are entrepreneurs, dads as well. Hopefully that was, uh, which I mean, a lot of it was generalized stuff that can apply to gals too as moms, but, um, yeah, but, but it's yeah. different when a fellow dad says it, it is different. Yeah. Just, and I'm sure it's the same thing for women when they hear from other entrepreneur moms, there's just a different relatability there. Um, just that's cause something that I'm actually going to turn into artwork. Oh, okay. So, it's, uh, like parent- at the end. Yeah, when you said at the end, no matter what you do, be there. Mm. Like, be there. That, I don't know if you realize, but at that moment, I was like kind of, you know, welling up with, yes, you know, that's Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, obviously, no, I don't think anyone listened here potentially didn't see the summit, but you, uh, you asked me if I had like one final thought for, for entrepreneur right. dads. And I said, wherever you are, be there. I just, 
Yeah, I heard that in a talk years ago, and it's resonated with with me ever since. And then especially becoming a dad myself, it's like yep. it's holds so true. So awesome! I love hearing that that impacted you. Hopefully, that resonated too with some of your your tribe. It so did. awesome, Tanya! <laughs> Thanks so much. We'll get this out here soon, and excited to see how this helps other web designers host an event, either online or local. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And if anybody has any questions, hit me up on social media. Awesome. Yeah, I'll have all that linked in the show notes. All right. Thanks, Tanya. We'll talk again soon. Okay. Thank you for having me, Josh. Have a great day. Hey, guys and gals, just wanted to pop in with a couple things before you head out. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast. I would love to hear your feedback, and it will also help other web designers find the show. Be sure to check out the show notes for this episode. Just go to joshhall.co, click on podcasts, and search this episode number, and you'll find all the links, descriptions, and resources we talked about. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe, and you'll be notified when the next episode is live. Thanks again for tuning in, and I'll catch you guys on the next episode.